to the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This ministry is founded on Mark 1-3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. After seeking the Lord in prayer, our name was given to us by the Lord. We invite you to like us on Facebook, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, where you can download all of our messages or email us at a voice of one crying at gmail dot com and request a message to be emailed. You must know the speaker's name, day, and date. Our speaker this evening is Pastor Bill Hughes. Pastor Hughes, we want to thank you so much for coming on the call this evening. Uh, we will turn the call now over to you for your uh, for our opening prayer and our evening message. The time is now yours. Well, thank you very much. It's always a privilege to be on the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Uh, before we begin, though, why don't we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for your love to us. We are grateful for your mercies, for your words that give us strength, and we pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us this evening and lead us into all truth and to share that truth with all the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I would like to open the meeting this evening with a story, a very exciting story that comes to us from the uh, continent of Africa from our brother over there in Zambia named Edward Katiba. Uh, Edward sends me a story of some missionary outreach uh, almost on a weekly basis. Um, the radio programs that we have over there have extended to many African countries uh, and uh, it's very, very exciting to see the message spreading all over Africa and uh, many, many people becoming Seventh-day Adventist Christians as a result of our programs. Uh, this story this evening comes actually from um, Angola, and um, there was a man, uh, he was an elderly gentleman, he was about, uh, actually he's still living as far as I know, but uh, he was 78 years old. He was uh, actually from the country of Portugal, but uh, somehow had ended up in the country of Angola. And he was a devout Roman Catholic man. Uh, 
had been a faithful uh, goer of the to the Catholic Church from the time he was very young, and he was now 78 years old. Well, there's a group in Angola in a in a town I don't know how large, but the name of the town is Luina, uh, and in Luina there was a gentleman uh, by the name of Seven Spirits. His his actual name was Kolut Ozi, uh, but Kolut Ozi had uh, he was an alcoholic, he was a drug addict, and uh, Kolut Ozi believed he he was under satanic uh, deception. He believed that he was the seven spirits described in Revelation chapter one and in Revelation chapter four. Well, we know very clearly that the seven spirits identified in those chapters in Revelation represent the perfect work of the Holy Spirit in working in a human being's life. Well, Kolut Ozi was under satanic deception, delusion, uh, when he would get into these drunken and uh, uh, drug-induced states of mind. And he actually, again, he believed he was the seven spirits of God. Well, anybody that crossed Koludozi, um, he took care of them. Uh, Literally beat them to a pulp, uh, killed people, uh, didn't care. Uh, And Koludozi gathered around him a band of about 25 young men. And nobody crossed uh, Koludozi and his band. Well, unbeknownst to Edward Katiba in Zambia, uh, he decided to go visit because there were there was a group of people in Luina, Angola, who had listened to our radio programs and had started meeting in a home, uh, worshiping the Lord every Sabbath and uh, doing outreach all over Angola. Well, Edward arrived in Luina, Angola, and he brought with him our DVD series on Daniel and Revelation. And one evening, Edward was, uh, after he arrived, he started playing these DVDs from those books of Daniel and Revelation. And uh, this went on for several hours, And in between the meetings, you know, people would go outside and they'd tell people along the street what they were doing. Well, it got back to Koludozi that uh, there were meetings going on where the book of Revelation was being described and nobody was talking about him. Well, immediately he became furious and he got his band of 20, 25 young men And they stormed the house, the little meeting hall, where Edward and the brethren were meeting in Luina, Angola. They came in, they demanded of Edward to stop the DVD, and they said, Koludozi, trying to intimidate Edward, said, who do you think you are and what are you showing people on this TV that's not exalting me? Well, Edward... From all I can see of Edward Katiba, he's a very humble man, but he's not one that you, he doesn't back down. And Edward told Koludozi and his men, he said, why don't you sit down and you can listen to this DVD and you can decide for yourselves whether this is true or not. Well, an unseen hand an unseen voice spoke to Koludozi and told him to sit down. And Koludozi told all his men to sit down with him, that they would listen to the sermon, but then they were going to uh, just shut down the meetings. Well, the meeting progressed, and the Holy Spirit took hold of Koludozi. And he was convinced, 100% convinced that what he was hearing on this DVD was the truth of God in the book of Revelation. And Koludozi realized that there was somebody bigger than him. 
and that there was a God in heaven that loved him. And that there was a God in heaven that could change his life and give his life purpose and meaning, whereas at this point in his life there was none. Well, when the tape got over, Koludozi came up to Edward and instead of there being fire in his eyes with the intent to shut down the meetings and even hurt Edward Katiba, uh, Koludozi had tears in his eyes. And he said, what that man said on that DVD was true. And he said, how can I get to know the God of heaven? And how can I give my life to him? Well, Edward explained to this brawling big man how to become a child of God and friends right there and then Koludozi became a follower of the one true God and of Jesus Christ and Koludozi told Edward he said Edward I want every DVD you have by this man I, I want to know the truth of God and I want to spread it all over this country of Angola Look, folks the Holy Spirit got a hold of this man and he wanted to share the truth. And he would go all over Angola to do just that. Well, the meetings ended. Koludozi was so happy. He had become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And he was on fire, just on fire. Well, the the people, the, the group there in Angola, they, uh, Angola is quite uh, economically advanced because of oil and Angola has quite a bit of money well the Angolan brethren were able to purchase a car and they called the car the three angels car and what they would do is they would get thousands of DVDs books Bibles tracts from Edward and Koludozi and some of the other brethren there in the Luina group they would pile into this car, and they're, they're going all over Angola sharing the truth with people through the books, uh, through Bibles, DVDs, and tracts. Well, Koludozi and his friends, his fellow brethren there in Luina, made their way to another town, a larger town on the coast of Angola. I think it's called Benguela, um, well, it was in Benguela, that's where Mario, the Portuguese man, the 78-year-old Roman Catholic, lived. And one day, as the as Coludozi and the brethren were handing out books and DVDs and tracts door-to-door, they came to Mario's home. Well, Mario opened the door, not knowing what to expect, and there were Coludozi and I don't know how many other brethren, they said, sir, we'd like to share with you a, a precious gift, uh, some books, uh, one called The Secret Terrorist, a National Sunday Law book, uh, some tracts on who changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday, and we want to share with you a series of about six DVDs on the book of Revelation. Now, those six DVDs, you put about five a one-hour sermons per DVD, so you can cover the entire book in six with six DVDs because you have five parts per DVD. Well, Mario was absolutely stunned in all his 78 years of living. Nobody had ever given him such a precious gift, and he almost had tears as he thanked Koludozi and the brethren from Luina for these precious, this precious gift of DVDs, of books, and tracts. Well, Mario closed the door, thanked the men, closed his door, and he put one DVD in, and it was on the book of Revelation. It was on Revelation chapter 13, about the first beast. And Coluzo, uh, not Coluzozi, but Mario, the Portuguese Catholic, Mario was stunned. 
He learned from Revelation 13 that a beast in Bible prophecy is a king, kingdom, or a world power. He realized that the kingdom, the first beast of Revelation 13, committed blasphemy. Revelation 13, one tells us that. And as, as Mario listened to the speaker, he realized that blasphemy in the Bible was when a man claimed to have power to forgive sins and claimed to be God on earth. Mario was shocked. He thought, well, I know a world power that claims to be able to do that. The very church I attend claims those prerogatives. Mario continued to listen, just shell-shocked, as he realized that his church had almost been obliterated in 1798. He realized that it was his church that had altered the day of worship from Sabbath or the seventh day of the week or Saturday and had changed it over to Sunday. Mario continued to listen as as it was his church that killed people because they didn't go along with what what the Pope said. And as Mario listened, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit rested on him with such power Mario said, I I can never, I can never be a church member in Rome again. But a little voice said, but Mario, you must share this material with your priest. Mario loved his priest. Mario had known this priest for probably 25 years. He loved him. But now Mario realized he had an obligation He had a divine responsibility to share with this priest what he had just learned. Well, Mario continued to watch Spellbound over the next several days to the DVDs. He read the tracks on who changed the day of worship. He read about what happens to a person when they die and that immortality only comes as a gift from Jesus. Mario was just amazed at what he was learning. And so Mario determined. He said, I must go on Sunday. I must go to my church, my Catholic church. And I must talk to the priest and seek to win him to the Jesus of the Bible. Well, that Sunday morning, Mario, the 78-year-old devout Roman Catholic, went to his church and went straight to the confessional and he went inside and there was his priest behind the curtain and the priest said, what have you come to confess, my son? And Mario boldly said to the priest, it is not I, priest, who needs to confess here today. It is you that must confess. Because you have been lying. You have been misleading. You have been deceiving your people, your parishioners, for so long. You have never opened the Bible to us. You have never studied the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. And you have lied to us by changing the day of of worship. And Mario said, you are the one that must repent. You are the one that must confess. Well, my, at that point, the priest was becoming just as red as a, as a strawberry. And he said, Mario, this is not the place. He said, I will come to your home tonight, and we can talk about it. Well, Mario left. He could no longer worship in a Catholic church. And later on that evening... Mario had a visitor at his home, and it was the priest. The priest came in, and Mario said to the priest, Sir, I cannot explain it as well as these DVDs. And he said, I want you to watch one with me. So Mario put in the DVD on Revelation chapter 17. Now, Revelation 17 describes the great whore, the apostate church of the Dark Ages that persecuted people, that was the mother of all the churches, that um, was very, very wealthy, 
that was united to the kings of the earth and the priests, as he listened to the words of this preacher, he became more and more and more angry. Mario was rejoicing and praising God for the truth he was learning, and the priest was ready to kill somebody. When the tape got done, Mario looked at the priest and said, There, sir, there is the truth of God, and it is that that you must speak to the people. The priest left Mario's home without saying a word. He was he was beside himself with anger. He was in a blind rage so that when he got back to the, the parish, he called three men whom he had used before under other circumstances. When the three men arrived at the priest's office, the priest said, Gentlemen, I need you to do a job for me this evening, and I need you to do it now. The priest went on, I need you to go to such and such a home. There is an elderly man living there. His name is Mario, and I want you to kill him. Oh, friends, we're told such lies today that Rome has changed. They haven't changed one bit. The only reason we think they've changed, it's not because Rome has changed, it's because we have changed. It's an apostate church that lessens the distance between the papacy and a Protestant church. It's an apostate church that does that. But Rome does not change. Well, the three men, these hired hit men, they got the address where Mario lived. They started off to Mario's home with guns. And they were going to kill Mario that very evening. They made their way to his home. And as they approached the door, there was a window that was open just off of the window. And inside, they they saw a man sitting in a chair. And they noticed that he was watching a DVD. And the men started to listen. And the DVD was about the second coming of Christ. And the hit men waited outside that door, outside that window, and listened with everything they'd had to words they'd never heard before. They listened about how Jesus was going to come again, how Jesus was going to take to heaven his faithful children, and about how Jesus had mansions that he was preparing for his faithful children, and that all people, all people had an opportunity to walk on those streets of gold in that wonderful and beautiful city of the New Jerusalem. The hit men could not move. They were in rapt attention, listening to the voice on that TV. They could not move. They could not do what they had come to do. And when the meeting ended and an entreaty was made for people to accept Christ as their Savior, the hit men were bowing in prayer. And when the prayer got done, the hit men knocked on the door. Mario opened the door and the hit men he invited them in. And the leader of the hit men said, Sir, we were asked to come here tonight to kill you. The priest wanted you dead. But when we approached your door tonight, something grabbed us. And somebody made us listen to what was on that, on that TV. And we can never hurt you now. We want to follow the God that we heard of in that DVD. So would you please give us DVDs? Would you please give us tracts and books or whatever you have so that we could learn about the God of heaven who loves his children? Well, friends, the hired hitmen had become the humbled hitmen. They had become followers of Christ. Mario gave them all that he had. The hitmen went back to the priest's office 
and said, Sir, why why would you want us to kill such a fine man as Mario? Why would you want us to hurt someone who is wanting only to follow the beautiful truth of the Bible? They said, We will never do that. Well, the hitmen left the office of the priest. The priest hired some more people. Well, as the hitmen were leaving Mario's place, I forgot to tell you, they told Mario, they said, Mario, you must leave. You must leave the tonight or you will be dead in the morning. Once those hitmen left, Mario gathered up a few things, loaded them into a, a car, and he was gone. And he headed to Luina. And it was in Luina where he told the story of the humbled hitmen and the attempts on his life that were done by the priest. Mario rejoiced that he could learn the truth as it is in Jesus, that he could learn the truth of Daniel and Revelation and the three angels' messages, and that he could be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and be ready for his soon coming. Oh, friends, I'm, I'm so grateful tonight that for the opportunity to be a part of this incredible missionary outreach over in Africa that continues to go on. And I could reel off South Africa, Malawi, Seychelles in the Indian Ocean, Zambia, Zimbabwe, um, Botswana, Angola, Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, Congo. It just goes on and on and on. Cameroon. I'm just grateful tonight for the opportunities to share the truth in, Af- in Africa and beyond so that many, many people will be ready when Jesus comes. That's just a short missionary story as to the work that is going on over in Zambia and in Africa in general. And I would just hope, friends, that we would do all we can to reach out to people, to share the truth with others, and uh, that others could know the truth as it is in Jesus. You know, I'd like to take a look with you this evening, Bible story, probably one that we're all quite familiar with. It's probably one of the most famous stories in all the Bible. Uh, you know, there's a few of those that you just, everybody knows them, whether it's the uh, Joshua and the Battle at Jericho, or um, Gideon and and the the trumpets and the uh, the lights, the flashlights or the torches. Uh, David and Goliath, uh, of course, Jesus walking on water. Uh, Paul, uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Well, we're not going to look at any of those this evening, but we're going to look at a, a a story that's very famous. And we're just going to look at a few thoughts in it this evening. Uh, I want to pick it up. Uh, actually, we'll pick it up in Judges chapter 13. Because this is such an important backdrop um, to this entire story. It's uh, Judges chapter 13, uh, starting with verse 3. The Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman. This is... Mrs. Manoah, and said to her, Behold now, thou art barren, bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and have, and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and not, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive, and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, clearly, friends, there's several points here. One point is is that 
this child was going to serve a an awesome role in the history of of Israel. He was going to play a major part in delivering Israel from their enemies, and in this case it was the Philistines. So the the importance of the uh, mission of this woman's son would be huge. It would be absolutely huge. And in preparation for that mission, both the mother and the child were given very, very specific health principles by which they were to live. Uh, They weren't to eat anything unclean. They weren't to drink uh, any fermented uh, wine. Um, Friends, the importance uh, of the health principles by which we live, we cannot stress enough. Samson had specific guidelines that he was to go by. Ours are no less important today, friends. We have a mission as well in Revelation chapter 14. And in order to accomplish that mission, we must take seriously the health principles that God has given to us as a people in the eight natural laws of health. Friend, if we are going to succeed in the mission for which God has called us, it will be because we have taken seriously the health laws that God has given to us as a people. So make no mistake, friends, the importance and the connection between the messages, the mission God has given to us, and us maintaining healthy minds, healthy bodies. We cannot minimize that in any way, shape, or form. The third point to keep in mind in this story that is very important is that Samson was to be a miracle child. Mrs. Manoah was barren. She could not have children. Just like Hannah, just like Sarah, just like Rachel, just like Elizabeth, and just like Mary, with every one of those women, they were all barren. None of them could have a son. None of them could have a child, period. (coughs) I'm on the phone. The God of heaven intervened in each of their lives and made it possible for them to have a child. A friend, there's a deep spiritual lesson in that. Desire of Ages tells us that these miracle children were to teach a lesson that in and of ourselves it is impossible for us to produce good works. Just as it was impossible for these women to have a child. But what we cannot do, the God of heaven will step in and will empower us to do what we cannot do. And each one of those children teach us that very, very valuable. Now, I think we all know the story. Samson marries a Philistine. Tragically, tragically, this weakness of Samson's destroyed, to a great extent, his work as a deliverer in Israel. Were it not for the grace, for the incredible grace of God, Samson's entire mission would have been destroyed. But God dealt long, long with Samson. And now I'm going to pass pass on and come in the story to Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16. The Bible says, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went into her. It was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in, laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. 
and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, took the doors of the gate of the city, the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders, carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Friend again, God miraculously, he miraculously saved Samson, as he did repeatedly through these last three chapters in the book of Judges, chapters 13, 14, and 15. Again, Samson got himself into a terrible mess through lust, but God miraculously delivered him. But Samson was running out of wiggle room. Samson was playing with fire, and friends, when you play with fire, you're going to eventually get burned. Well, we read in Judges chapter 16 and verse 4, the Bible says it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, folk, the word love there, it has to do with sexual attraction. It's not a pure love. It's not a love based on principle. It's a love based on pure sex. It was all about the animal passions with Samson. So really the verse should say, and it came to pass afterward, that Samson lusted after a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Friends, love is a principle. Lust is something you do simply because you feel like it. Lust is is living in a physical relationship with a woman outside of marriage. That's lust, friend. That's not love. It's not love. Don't kid yourself. Don't fool yourself. A relationship, a, a physical relationship outside of marriage is lust. It's animal passion, period. has nothing to do with the pure principle of love. Samson lusted. And friend, any relationship that is built on lust will be destroyed. It, it, it has no, no other alternative. So Samson and Delilah build a relationship on, on sex. Let's, let's just be frank, friend. In any relationship that is based on sex, it's not love, it's lust. So Samson and Delilah, what a relationship they had. Delilah wants to know the secret of his strength, and Samson keeps lying to her. And Delilah keeps tricking him. And Delilah keeps trying to weave a net to catch him because she wants money that the Philistines have offered to her. I mean, friend, what kind of relationship is this? You know, lies, deceptions, um, enticement, uh, wanting, you know, Samson lusted for Delilah, Delilah lusted for the money, and so now they're playing this cat and mouse game. This isn't love. This is this is ridiculous. And then finally, in verse 17, the tragic part of the story happens when Samson says, There has not come a razor on my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And so, friends, the outward sign of Samson's strength, the, the long hair, it was finally cut. And in the cutting of that hair, that outward sign became folly because Samson was cutting off his relationship with God. A friend, it's fascinating to me in the Bible how outward signs represent inward experiences. Circumcision in the covenant with Abraham Circumcision was the outside sign of the fact that the carnal heart, that sin, was being cut away from Abraham's life. And that's what circumcision was. In the Noachan, in the, in the covenant made with Noah, in 
Genesis chapter 9. We know that there was an outward sign, and that was the rainbow. And that was the promise. That was the promise that God would keep Noah and his family from another flood. So we have outward signs of an inward experience of faith and trust and dependence upon the God of heaven to do what he's promised. Samson had an outward sign of an inward experience. When that was severed, there was nothing left, and Samson would be destroyed. Well, there's one other people down here at the end of time that has an outward sign of an inward experience. They're called Seventh-day Adventists. The outward sign of the relationship they have with their maker is the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is the sign of the relationship they have with God. You cut off that, rela- you cut off that outward sign, friend. You've destroyed that covenant relationship. Make no, make no mistake about it. That's why Ellen White says we need to guard the Sabbath faithfully. We need to guard the Sabbath hours. Well, tragically, one of the saddest passages in all the Bible, in verse 20, right at the end of the verse, it says, And Samson said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wished not that the Lord was departed from him. You see, friends, that outward sign, once that was severed, the relationship was cut. Samson departed from the Lord, and the Lord had no choice but to step away from him. Verse 22 tells us, Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. You know, friend, how, how amazing is God's grace. How tender is his mercy. How willing he is to woo and to, to empower us to walk with him. And so here, Samson has cut off his relationship, but God listens to his repentant heart, listens to his confessions of, of wrong, listens to his penitence, and his humiliation. And God forgives. God forgives. And Samson's hair begins to grow. Well, we hasten on to the final verses in Judges chapter 16 as we're about to close. And we find that there's a great party we read about in verses 23 and 24. And... It's in the temple of Dagon, the fish god of the Philistines. And the people want Samson to come and make sport. They want to see the the man who had scared them for so long. They want to see him a captive. They want to see him destroyed. They want to see him humiliated. So they bring him into this huge temple that had thousands of people in it. And Samson requested of the young man that was guiding him in, because Samson's eyes had been put out, and he was in chains. Samson asked if he could have his arms placed around the two pillars where he had come into this gigantic temple. And so Samson is standing there with his arms around these gigantic pillars, and Samson prays. Samson knows that his life is over. He's lost his eyes. And Samson knows that his mission as a deliverer in Israel was to defeat Israel's enemy, the Philistines. And so Samson prays in verse 28, and he says, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me only this once that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And in verse 30, Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And so Samson moved those gigantic pillars, and he brought that house down 
the Temple of Dagon came crashing down and thousands of Philistines died that day. Well, friends, before we close, you know, how how amazing is God's mercy? How, how amazing is His grace that can forgive, that can heal, that can restore? You know, some people have become confused and said, well, Samson committed suicide. Friends, Samson died, but Samson didn't kill himself like Saul did. The first king of Israel, he killed himself because he was disgusted. He hated his life. He realized what a what a mess he had made, and and Saul just wanted to he wanted to end it all. It was in self it was self murder, friends. That's what it was. It was self murder. Samson was very different. Samson wasn't, he wasn't uh, angry with, you know, what he had done with his life. He wasn't depressed. He just, he knew the only way that he could fulfill his mission was if he died. So, friend, it's completely different in how Samson died versus how Saul did. Saul committed suicide, self-murder. Samson did not. Finally, as we close this evening, I want you to think on a passage in Hebrews chapter 11 as we close. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. You know, there were many great people found in Hebrews 11. There's Enoch. There's uh, Abraham, there's Jacob, there's Isaac, there's uh, Moses, David, a lot of lot of mighty mighty men of old. But you know, when you read Hebrews eleven thirty two, you you kind of you go, wow. As the Bible says, what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also, of Samuel, and of the prophets. Folk, God didn't forget Samson. Oh, he made a lot of mistakes. Yeah, he sure did. And yes, yes, he didn't fulfill the full mission for which God had raised him up, but he did begin to deliver the Israelites out of the hand of the Philistines. And Samson's name is emblazed in that great hall of faith. And I believe, friend, that every person there, from Abraham to Enoch to Abel to Moses to Samson, will all agree that the only reason their names are there is because of the wonderful name of Jesus, that it's Christ and Him crucified that yearned, that longed, that pleaded, that that wooed, that molded, that changed, that made these people fit vessels to walk in that hall of faith. Friend, we have so much to be thankful for tonight. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you tonight. Thank you tonight for your amazing grace. Thank you that you didn't give up on Samson, even though you had every right to. And thank you that you don't give up on us either, even though you have every right to. Thank you that you listen to penitent, repentant hearts. Thank you that you're in the build, in the business of restoration, of healing. We thank you for this story tonight that gives us strength and hope for tomorrow. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Um, thank you so much, Pastor Hughes. And Pastor Hughes, um, you know, we want to thank God for not giving up on us. I know I'm thanking him for not giving up on me. 
So um, with that being said, we thank you for the message this evening. Um, we're going to be blessed to hear it all um, the weekend long. But before you leave, can you please share your contact information? Sure, Sister Jackie. My uh, address is uh, Truth Triumphant, and that's uh, Box 1417. And the town is Eustis, that's E-U-S-T-I-S. The state is Florida. The zip code is 32727. And that's my email. Uh, My email is n3232 at cs.com. Pastor Hughes, can you also share your YouTube channel for those who may want to um, go on this very lovely messages? So could you share that information also? Of course, Sister Jackie. The YouTube channel is called Truth Triumphant YouTube. Truth Triumphant uh, YouTube. Uh, I would encourage all of you to tune in there. We have series on Daniel, Revelation, uh, Hebrews, Elijah, uh, the Jesuit order in history and current events. Um, you know, we just have all kinds of programming that are being a blessing to people actually all over the world. So uh, hope you'll tune into it and uh, be blessed. Amen, amen. I can attest to that. Okay, thank you so much, Pastor Hills, and um, we thank you, and we pray that God's will will get a chance to Get you back again soon. Thank you. <laughs> Will do, Sister Jackie. God bless you, too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Again, we just want to thank Pastor Hughes always for coming on and sharing these present truth messages with us. And I know I can also say that um, I thank God for not letting me go. I thank him. Um, so you can hear this call again by dialing 712 Seven seven five seven zero eight nine, and use the same pin code you use to come in, which is five 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 one four five pound. This call will be available until our next call, and our next call will be on uh, our next live call. Um, will be on Monday, and I'm looking, but I do not have the lineup for next week, so just stay tuned. <laughs> And um, also, um, if you would like a CD for this message or any of our past speakers, you can send a $5 donation to The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness, P.O. Box 8441, and that is Laverne, California, 91750-8441. And um, please make your check or money order payable to Vaughn, and that is with a V, V A U G H N Williams. Continue to send in your prayer requests. Um, you can email us, and our email, our new email address, uh, if you have a paper or pencil, please write it down. It's A as in Apple, B as in Victory, O O, C as in Cat. 2019 at gmail.com. Again, that's A V O O C 2019 at gmail.com. So the abbreviation is just a voice of one crying. 2019 at gmail.com. And you can hear all our messages on there also. And, um, Continue to send in your prayer requests. And oh, you can text or call Sister Jackie, that's myself, at 773-415-1562. We want to thank all our callers for uniting with us in your daily prayers and or your financial support. Our speakers are very, very appreciative. If the Holy Spirit put upon your heart to send in a small donation or whatever is on your heart, um, they're out here doing the work, uh, and, you know, anything would help, and they would truly appreciate it. 
But most importantly, your prayers are definitely appreciated. Um, and um, I'm going to say a prayer because you on you know, Thursdays. We ask our speaker to pray for our prayer list, but um, I'll pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, as we come to you humbly and yet boldly before your throne of grace, thanking you for giving us this privilege of prayer. Thanking you that we can bring our petitions before your throne of grace and knowing that we have a God who hear our prayers. Not a God that's made of stone, but a God of the creator of the universe. And so, Father, we have many prayer requests. Some of them are spiritual. Some of them are for physical healing. Some of them have lost loved ones and their hearts are hurting. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would put each and every case into the palm of your hands, Lord. Put it in your bosom. And so, Father, we also ask for those who are having financial issues. We have those who are trying to move out the city to the country, Lord, and where you told us to go. So, Father, we ask that you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out the blessings that there shall not be room enough to receive. And, Father, I ask also, Lord, that you would be with our speakers. Be with every caller that come on the line, even for those who come on for the playback. Oh, Father, give them the desires of their hearts. You said delight yourself in you, and you would give us the desires of our hearts. But we have to delight ourselves in you, make you our highest delight. Father, I ask, Lord, that... um, you would be with the unspoken prayer request on this call. And so, Father, with that, we will be ever so careful to give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Um, and by God's grace, you can also hear us at ServantWithTheMission.com Internet Radio. Uh, I want to thank Sister Janine for standing in the gap again for me. Uh, I had to go take care of some things. So thank you, Sister Nina. And as I close out, amid discord and strife, a voice was heard from the wilderness, a voice startling and stern, yet full of hope. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's taken from the Desire of Ages, page 104. I pray that everyone have a blessed evening, have a blessed preparation day, and most importantly, Have a very, very blessed Sabbath. And until we meet again, goodbye. And most importantly, have a very, very blessed Sabbath. And until we meet again, goodbye.